Today, I want to take you on a journey, my personal journey, of having family members affected by brain diseases, the inspiration to what led me to become a neuroscience researcher, and some of the challenging ethical and moral dilemmas associated with this area. So, I'd like to take you back to begin our journey in the mid-90s. Now, I realise some of you may not have been born, but let's face it, I was probably listening to the Spice Girls on my tape player, and I'd regularly make the journey from Gloucester to Newport to visit my grandparents. Here they are, my nana Patricia on the left, and my grandcha Ted on the right. As I'd walk up to their door, trundling along to go and meet them, I'd knock on the door and be warmly welcomed by my nana. She'd give me a great big hug and she'd say, oh, Emma, haven't you grown? She'd welcome me in, we'd have tea and cake and catch up about what I'd been doing at school and what she'd been doing too. And then she'd say again, oh, haven't you grown? And in the beginning, I thought this was quite funny. Maybe I had grown just a couple of centimetres in the two hours since she'd asked, last asked me the same question. But then her questions began to become a bit more concerning. Oh, haven't you grown turned into, sorry, who are you? What was your name again? And I began to get quite worried about my nana. So eventually, I plucked up the courage to ask my mum what was wrong with nana. Now, I don't think my mum was anticipating me asking this question. So she kind of sucked her teeth for a while and then said, well, Emma, Nana's poorly. Her brain's broken. And as a young child, this really scared me. It really worried me. And I vividly remember my response to my mum was, well, if her brain's broken, why can't we just fix it? And this is really where my understanding and want to learn more about the brain began. Because even as an adult, why is it that we're more concerned, fearful, and distressed about diseases that relate to the brain compared to any other organ of the body? Well, perhaps that's because it's our brains that make us uniquely human. They give us our most cherished memories, our ability to speak to one another, to plan what we're doing every day. And ultimately, it's really scary if the brain goes wrong. When it does, what can we do about it? Now, our brains probably make us who we are. And when we think about our identity and what makes us us, we might initially think about our physical characteristics, our hair colour, our eye colour, perhaps even how tall you are. And these physical characteristics, at least in part, are controlled by our genetics. Now, the term genetics, genes and genome, often gets kind of banded around. So what are our genes and what do they do? Well, our genetic information, or code, is a series of chemical letters that are repeated over and over again. And that makes up our genome. To give you some context here, Inside each of your cells, you have about two meters of genetic information, or DNA. And the average person has about 50 trillion cells. So that's about 100 trillion meters of DNA wrapped up tightly inside you. To give you some further context, that's the same distance as going from the sun to the earth and back, not once, not twice, but over 300 times. So we have an awful lot of genetic information that makes us who we are. But what happens when our genetic information collides with the world of brain diseases and disorders? Well, some people estimate that there's about 10 million people in the UK living with a neurological condition now, that's any sort of disease that might affect the brain. But the brain diseases I'm interested in are neurodegenerative diseases. You may even know someone living with a neurodegenerative disease, such as Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, or Huntington's disease. 
You may even go on to develop one yourself, as one in three of us, unfortunately, will. And the numbers of people impacted by neurodegenerative disease is almost certainly going to increase. We have an ageing population, better diagnoses and increased understanding. And there are a range of ethical dilemmas that this throws up that I really want you guys to think about today. So how does the world of genetics and the world of brain diseases come together? Well, this really depends on the specific brain disease or disorder that we're talking about. For about seven years now, I've been working on a particular disease called Huntington's disease. That's a rare brain disorder, and you may well have heard it referred to as Huntington's chorea. That's because chorea comes from the Greek meaning to dance, and people who have Huntington's disease often show a shaking, jerking movement, much like they were dancing uncontrollably. These symptoms are often shown in the latter stages of the disease. But as we understood more and more about it, we actually now know that these symptoms are preceded by cognitive and psychiatric problems, often decades before you see those really obvious motor symptoms. Things like apathy, anxiety, and lack of motivation are all really concerning for patients, but also for family members. And one of the reasons that I got involved in Huntington's disease research is because it's what we call a model genetic disorder. It's really rare, it affects about 1 in 12,000 people. But the really unique and special thing about Huntington's disease is it's caused by one single gene. That's really, really rare. And in terms of study, that makes it really, really important. Because if people know they're at risk of Huntington's disease, they can choose to have a predictive test. That's a genetic test that they can have before they show any of the symptoms that will tell them with certainty whether they have that gene within their body. It will tell them whether they will go on to develop this disease. And unfortunately, with Huntington's disease, if you have that disease-causing gene, there's a 50% chance that you might pass it on to your children. So if you know your genetic status, and we know about 40% of people who are at risk choose to have that predictive genetic test, who should know about that information? Your confidential, unique genetic information, who should know about it? And whose responsibility is it to tell others? At the moment, it's completely up to the individual who they choose to share that genetic information with. They may well choose to tell their children of their genetic status, and they may not. That is their right, and there are personal decisions behind that. But I want to pose that question to you guys today. Who should have access to your unique genetic information? Because it's confidential. It shows us whether you're going to develop certain diseases. And who should know about that? Well, going back to my own personal family history now, the question in terms of genetics is a bit more complex for dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So, I'd like to introduce you to my parents, um, my mum Joyce and my dad Mike, pictured on their wedding day here in 1977. Now, my dad's not a researcher, a scientist or a doctor, but he has always wondered if because his parents had Alzheimer's disease, whether he was more likely to develop the condition. And that's a really scary thought, that you may well go on to develop a condition that you've seen devastate your parents. Their genetic situation is more complex with Alzheimer's disease. There are genetic risk factors, but we don't specifically know, unlike Huntington's disease, what causes Alzheimer's disease. It's probably likely to be a mixture of genetic factors and environmental factors. And susceptibility genes are just that. You, they might make you more or indeed less susceptible but they won't, with absolute certainty, mean that you go on to develop the disease. 
And for those reasons, genetic testing for these susceptibility genes isn't offered on the NHS, and it's certainly not recommended. Although some companies do charge a fee to sequence that genetic information. But as medicine and research moves on, we talk about personalised medicine. This idea that one day babies will have their genetic information sequenced, perhaps at birth, and drugs will be designed specifically for them, taking into account their unique genetic information. Well, if that does happen, that throws up loads of really interesting ethical, moral and social issues that we should all be aware of. This is a picture of myself uh, and my sisters uh, with my mum and dad. I am one of triplets and I'll leave you to guess which triplet I am. But I wanted to put this picture up today to highlight the fact that we were the result of in vitro fertilisation. We were so-called test tube babies, although that's not a term that I particularly like myself. And when the first test tube baby, Louise Brown, was born back in 1978, 30 years ago now, there were a range of questions that that threw up. Would she develop normally? Should we be playing God? Should we be intervening in terms of fertility treatment? But now IVF and fertility treatments are being used more and more. And we certainly had lots of debates on those wider issues at the time, but I think we need more debates on the potential consequences that our increased knowledge in terms of genetic information has. It's undoubted that these questions are coming. Our knowledge is advancing and increasing. And your views, your opinions may well be different from your friends, family members, your work colleagues, or perhaps even the person sat next to you. But they're important because they matter, and these issues are likely to affect you. Modern medicine and science is advancing, and we need to be ready for it. Thank you.